Mike is now going to review all the top most exciting stories of the year. Thank you. Thank you again so much, Paul. Uh, <laughs> folks, we'd like to ask that you put your cell phones away. At the end of the show, uh, you can either use the upper doors to exit, or if you have any more questions for me, you can take the lower exit. I'm going to walk you around to Science on a Sphere, which is going to be our Q&A area, if you have any more questions about the topics. Yeah, really exciting time, amazing year we've just wrapped up for astronomy. So many things happened in this year. And I'm going to target three of the big ones. The Artemis return to the moon mission, the DART mission, which is a mission to essentially punch an asteroid in the nose, and also the success of the James Webb Space Telescope, all key events of this year. Now, all astronomy has its origins with just kind of going out and looking up. So here we are. Here's the sky you'd actually see uh, tonight if the clouds weren't there. Put a few clouds on there for verisimilitude. <laughs> and let's head on out and just view the stars for a moment as we'd see it from New Jersey, although going out to the countryside away from the bright lights of our fair city. I couldn't find a song called Planetarium, so I found one called Aquarium by... <laughs> Camille Sanson, the great French composer. Sun goes down really early, around a little before 5 o'clock. So out there in the countryside, there are thousands of stars overhead. And uh, there also, we have the moon tonight. So that is the only place that we have ever had human beings walk besides our home planet Earth. And so th the moon and getting back to the moon is one really big story about 2022. The Artemis One mission, the first step to get back to the moon. So speaking of anniversaries, so December, this last December, was the 50th anniversary of the last time that any human being walked upon the moon. It's been that long. And in fact, the famous Apollo program was only a four-year program in terms of people going to the moon. So the first Apollo mission to orbit the moon was Apollo 8. That was in the year 1968. Most of you weren't there in 1968. I was. It was a rough, rough year. Assassinations protests, cities on fire, Vietnam. And then at the very end of 1968, three astronauts in Apollo 8 orbited the moon and showed us what, what we had never seen before, the sight of our home planet from a quarter million miles away. They even read a Christmas message from the moon as they were there. It's been called the mission that saved the year 1968. So seven months later, the more famous Apollo 11 landing occurred, but actually a lot of astronauts went to the moon and a lot of them walked upon the moon. But the absolute last mission was 50 years ago this last month, so December of 1972, Apollo 17. The later Apollo missions brought moon buggies that allowed them to go far afield and collect rocks and all that. So amazing how much was achieved in those four years, 68 to 72. Also amazing though, we not only haven't been back to the moon in all that time, we haven't had a rocket to get us to the moon in 49 years. And in fact, NASA hasn't had a rocket to even send humans to low Earth orbit since the space shuttle was retired in 2011. But all of that is changing. So their new mission to the moon is called Artemis. It's a partnership with commercial uh, spacecraft companies and also with the European Space Agency and the Canadian Space Agency. And so they have a couple of things they got to have to make a lunar return possible. First of which is a new moon rocket. And they do now finally have a new moon rocket. It's called the Space Launch System, not the sexiest title ever invented for a lift vehicle, but a pretty amazing machine. 322 feet tall, a giant center tank full of liquid fuel, and then side rocket boosters like the space shuttle had that give it an extra oomph right at liftoff. And so this vehicle, all of this that you see here is to get a little Orion capsule right up there 
going fast enough to break the bonds of our gravity and get from the Earth to the moon. So the space launch system is the system. The actual mission is called Artemis One. And the first mission was not one that had a crew on board. You don't want to put people on board your very first test of this giant launch system. So like the Hubble Space Telescope, I mean like the James Webb Space Telescope, there were many delays in the space launch system, but it did get going in uh, mid-November. We're going to watch this animation first. When we did the animation, we didn't realize, of course, that the actual liftoff would be at 1.45 in the morning. So, but this daylight view gives us a very good example, uh, idea of what the system looks like. As we get to the engines, the engines are actual space shuttle type engines called RS-25 engines. There are four of them on the center tank here of the space launch system. If I just pause right before liftoff. <laughs> Missed it by one second. <laughs> So these four giant engines provide the main thrust. Again, they're the same engines you'd see in the back of the Space Shuttle Orbiter. But there's also the two side rockets. And when we see the actual liftoff in a moment, notice, first of all, that these middle rockets here fire first, five seconds before liftoff. So it's five seconds before liftoff, they come on. But it's only when the side rockets actually ignite that the vehicle leaves the launch pad. So let's go and continue to the end of this liftoff. Now let's look at the actual liftoff as it really occurred at 1.45 in the morning on the 16th of November. So uh, it's takes a moment to see what you're looking at. So here again are those big central RS-25 engines at the bottom of the main tank. Here are the side rockets that burn the solid fuel. So when you'll hear the countdown, you'll notice when they get to five, these babies turn on. But it's only at zero when the side rockets turn on that the actual assembly leaves the launch pad. So away we go. Hydrogen burn off igniters initiated. This this was uh, November 16, so in the middle of November, 1.45 in the morning, the liftoff occurred. They had made a couple of attempts beforehand that were delayed by technical problems. They were going to try a third time, but the third time what happened was that the, uh, this Hurricane Ian came along and they had to roll a whole assembly back into the uh, assembly building. So the other new thing, besides the actual vehicle for liftoff, is the new moon capsule, which is called the Orion capsule. That was also being tested for the first time. So liftoff on the 16th of November. It only takes a few days to get to the moon, which is looking really tiny here in our animation. And then to save fuel, it did these really loopy orbits around the moon. You know, it was a 25-day long mission and then did a final pass to get enough oomph from the moon's gravity to get fired back towards Earth. Again, not any human beings on board. Rather, there are mannequins, but it did come back to Earth and landed on the 11th of December in the middle of the day. So there are a lot of similarities between Apollo and Artemis and a lot of things that are different. This is Artemis I, an uncrewed mission. So the, probably the biggest similarity is that the landings for both missions on Earth are almost identical. They splash down in the ocean. Here is Artemis I coming back on December 11, splashing down in the ocean to be recovered by NASA vessels off of Baja, California. And so that's Artemis I. Artemis II, they're planning in two years, will be another orbital mission, but with a really big difference, there'll be astronauts on board, four astronauts. And then Artemis III, uh, maybe four years from now, they'll actually land on the moon. So if the landing is very similar, what's radically different is how they're landing on the moon itself. 
So basically, they, uh, with the Apollo mission, they had one basically giant rocket, the Saturn V, that contained everything you need for getting to the moon, landing on the moon, lifting off from the moon, and coming back to Earth. But that's not the model with Artemis. They are partnering with both the European Space Agency and with commercial spacecraft companies. And in fact, SpaceX is making the vehicle that's going to land the uh, astronauts on the moon. Their vehicle is called the Starship. When it gets finished, it's going to be the biggest rocket, even taller than the one we just saw, the Space Launch System. Just two parts, a booster and the Starship itself. This is animation. There again is the Starship part that will travel to the moon. They hope to do an orbital test of this sometime this coming year. So then it goes off to the moon. And so the Starship, the SpaceX craft, rendezvous in lunar orbit with the Orion capsule that has our four astronauts. And two of those four astronauts will then get on board the Starship here and descend to the lunar surface. Again, we think this will be 2026, a few years from now. So two will stay on the capsule uh, for six days, and the other two will descend to the surface and will do at least two EVAs uh, walking on the moon during this trip. NASA is very committed to diversity, uh, and they're committed to having a person of color and a woman in the team that walks on the moon for the first time with this Artemis mission. So landing vertically, that's a real typical thing with SpaceX, and then taking off vertically as well. And they really hope to come back to stay this time, to really establish a lunar base, to really get experience living on the moon so they can then make the next great leap, which is to send a human being or a crew of humans to Mars. So that's a really big human spaceflight story after a time when it's been a little quiet on the human spaceflight front, uh, but it could revolutionize our odds of getting not only to having a permanent place on the moon, but then going to Mars, which is a much bigger undertaking. It takes about three years to go to Mars and back, so you want to really practice in your own neighborhood on the moon before you do that. So that is the first of our three big stories. The second of our big stories to understand why we did this mission called DART, we have to go back to the very beginning. 66 million years ago on a Tuesday. So one day like no other day, the last day of the dinosaurs, we're pretty sure now that an asteroid struck the Earth and put all this matter into the atmosphere, blocked off the sun for about two years. The plants died, and then the plant-eating dinosaurs died, and then the meat eaters who ate, ate the plant eaters died. And that's gone from being an out-of-left-field theory put forth in 1980 to being the accepted explanation for what led to the demise of the dinosaurs. And we should thank that asteroid, because I'm not sure we'd all be sitting in this room today if we still had to share the Earth with Tyrannosaurus rex. Having said that, we really want to make sure this never happens again. To their credit, it was Congress who told NASA they needed to study near-Earth asteroids, asteroids in danger of striking Earth, and find ways to prevent them from striking our planet. And that was the genesis of the DART mission. DART is Double Asteroid Redirection Test. Launched right before Thanksgiving 2021 and uh, struck its target asteroid in September of this last year. So here is the actual target. So there's a big asteroid and a little asteroid. Many asteroids have their own moons. The big one, half a mile across, is called Didymus, and this is called Dimorphos, about 500 feet across. Because it was a moon, NASA figured they could easily measure exactly how much they impacted the asteroid by seeing if they could shrink how long it takes it to orbit its main asteroid. It takes about 12 hours for, D for Dimorphos to go around its parent asteroid. So if they could strike it, and then measure if they shrank the length of the orbit, that would tell them how effective their asteroid impact was. So basically, it's a pretty 
straightforward mission. You take a space probe, you launch it, and you smack it into an asteroid. It only cost $313 million, which, I mean, there are Hollywood movies that cost a lot more than that. So it's a pretty good investment considering that it could literally save the lives of everyone on our planet someday to get experience trying to stop asteroids that are heading our, our way. So here's an animation before we go to the actual real footage. So no, we'll go back to that in a moment. That's the actual real footage. Show the animation first, Shanahan, and then that. So the mission animation to show you the departure of it, first of all, from Earth. So here is the DART mission. Launched again 24th of November 2021. Uh, the asteroid pair it was heading for, about six million miles away when impact happened. And then it came and encountered this double asteroid. So in the animation I'm going to show you in a moment, we'll see the actual impact. Again, uh, the interesting thing is Dimorphos, this target asteroid, its name means two-bodied. When they named it in 1996, they were already planning to smack it with, with a probe. And therefore, its, its, its shape was going to change because of the impact. So that is how it was supposed to go, and that is actually how it actually went. So here is actually real footage. Our plucky little probe, again called DART, was taking pictures right up to the point of impact. So there is Dimorphos, our target, and actual footage from the DART mission, loosely packed in about 500 feet across. And the plucky little last space probe was taking pictures right up, beginning one final picture when it smacked right into Dimorphos and the mission came to an end. And they measured it, and it turns out they would have considered this mission a success if they had shortened the orbit of Dimorphos by only 73 seconds out of its 12-hour trip around its main asteroid. Instead, they shortened its orbit by 32 minutes by smacking it with this probe. So that is a really good payoff. We don't have any asteroids, asteroids of any size heading for us now, but we want to be ready. And so here in, uh, back in... September, NASA was actually able to test out this idea of one day being able to strike an asteroid and divert it from striking Earth. Also, the Hubble Space Telescope was able to look at the impact and take a picture of it. And in addition to the Hubble, the next topic of our program, the final topic, the James Webb Telescope was also able to look at and show this impact. So again, a simple mission. An expensive mission, but could be absolutely a game changer, a lifesaver for our planet. And then the final of the three topics we're going to talk about is the one you probably have heard the most about for very good reason. Another thing like the space launch system that was discussed forever and a day, but the James Webb telescope, when it did pay off, it really paid off. It's our brand new space telescope that came online this year with the first image released on July 11. So here we are again in, at the nighttime sky, just after 6 o'clock, there's that moon again. We can also see the Milky Way, which is our own galaxy. I want to mention what galaxies are, because it's, galaxies are really important with the story of James Webb. So the galaxies, a galaxy is a giant city of stars, usually billions if not trillions of stars all grouped together. The word galaxy comes from the Greek word for milk, so their word for it is very similar to the Milky Way. And until uh, about 101 years ago, we thought there was only one galaxy, the Milky Way. So this is an area where we have billions of stars that are too far away to be seen as dots, but so many of them, they make a Milky Band across the sky. The stars you can see are also part of the Milky Way, but close enough to appear as individual dots of light. In fact, in this view, every single thing you see, with one exception, is in our Milky Way galaxy. That exception right here is a little fuzzy patch that for a long time was called the Andromeda Nebula. A nebula is just a fuzzy patch in space. But then in uh, 19... 23, so 100 years ago, in October of that year, Edwin Hubble discovered that that was no nebula, that it was, in fact, another galaxy 
about two million light years away. In fact, a bigger galaxy than ours, the light you see left over two million years ago. Although it's bigger than us, it's ours, it's shaped a lot like ours. If it was our galaxy, we on Earth would be right there, about halfway out, kind of like a blueberry inside of a blueberry pancake. And from being inside of our galaxy, what we see is this fuzzy patch across the sky. So for 10 to 1,000 years, we look up and try to figure out what the stars are all about. And then 1609, along comes a telescope invented by Galileo, or at least used for astronomy for the first time by Galileo, revolutionizes astronomy. And right away, a couple of things come up. To have a good telescope, you need the biggest possible way to absorb light, collect light, whether it's a mirror or a lens. And you got to get out of town. You got to get away from the city, from the city light, from the city air pollution, and get as high up as possible where the air is thin. So after a few hundred years of doing this, they realized, hey, the best place for a telescope is in outer space. The most famous space telescope, at least until now, was called the Hubble Space Telescope. So let's go ahead and pay a visit to the Hubble, first of all, 340 miles above our heads low Earth orbit, launched by the space shuttle, and actually famously repaired as well by several different space shuttle missions. So here is the Hubble, about a seven-foot diameter mirror, and uh, looking at the universe in the same light that your eyeballs see, invisible light, revolutionized our knowledge of astronomy. But now let's compare that to the new telescope in town, the James Webb Space Telescope launched on Christmas Day, 2021. It came online this year. So first of all, in terms of mirror size, 21 feet across, so three times the diameter of the Hubble's mirror. And also, the web doesn't look at the same light our eyeballs see. The web instead looks at heat, which is also called infrared. And because of that, it can't be anywhere near any distracting sources of heat. And the Earth is a really distracting source of heat. It can't be near the Earth like Hubble is. In fact, it is almost a million miles away from Earth. It took over 30 days to get there from its launch in late December 2021. So let's go to visit the James Webb, where it actually lives, four times as far away as is the moon. It's called the Lagrange two-point. It's a position in space where both the Earth and the Sun are always in the same part of the sky, so you can block them both out with a single, giant, tennis court-sized solar shield. So there is the shield, always in between where the Sun and the uh, Earth are. So on this side, the side facing the Sun and the Earth, it is 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Here, where the mirrors are, it is minus 370 Fahrenheit, only 50 degrees above absolute zero. So in that location, it's really ready to go to work. And its first picture came out on the 11th of July, looking at a tiny part of the sky the size of a grain of sand held at arm's length. Let's have a look at the first image released from the James Webb called the James Webb Deep Field, looking at a little itsy-bitsy piece of the heavens. show it in a small circular frame first, and then we'll go ahead and blow it up to the dome because we can. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure if any of you ever saw the first really major IMAX film is called To Fly, and it starts with a tiny frame of a guy in a balloon, and then a moment later it goes to the full IMAX dome being filled, and this is our 2022 planetary version of that. So anything that is an eight-pointed star is a star in our own Milky Way. Everything else you see is a galaxy, a giant city of stars. That includes ones that are shaped kind of like whirlpools, like our own galaxy is. And it also includes these big, massive galaxies in the center. These are so massive that they're bending the light of more distant galaxies, kind of lensing their light around them, allowing us to see these more distant galaxies. Although all these galaxies are really distant, the foreground galaxies are 
billion light years away. So traveling at 186,000 miles a second still takes like 4.6 billion years to reach the Webb telescope from that galaxy cluster. So the Earth and the Sun were just forming when this light left those galaxies that are captured now in this picture. Often, by the way, the uh, oddly shaped galaxies like these are the ones that are the biggest because often you have smaller galaxies, often whirlpool-like, collide and create bigger kind of blob-shaped galaxies. So this is, again, 4.6 billion miles away, uh, light years away in terms of the ones in the center. Getting a little bit closer to home, we're going to look at the, uh, what's called the Cartwheel, not the Cartman, the Cartwheel Galaxy. And this is one that's about 500 million light years away. So quite a bit further away than our neighbor, the Andromeda, like 250 times further away. So this is one of those galaxies that went through a collision, like I mentioned. Something else kind of collided with it uh, 200 million years before this image. And the impact stretched out the dust and the stars into these various spokes that you see. And right along the edge, here you have a lot of new star formation here. If you want to make stars, that's a good way to do it. You take two galaxies and crash them together, and that generates lots of new stars. So again, the Cartwheel Galaxy. Uh, I don't want to freak you out, but in approximately 2 billion years, our own Milky Way is going to have a very similar collision with our nearest neighbor, the Andromeda Galaxy. So Andromeda is the big one, is the small one, our own Milky Way, and they'll eventually come together into one big, non, no longer whirlpool-shaped galaxy. Know that both these galaxies have massive black holes. The black holes will also fuse together into an even more massive black hole. So stay tuned for that coming in two billion years to a galaxy very close to your own. Uh, and uh, look for that. <laughs> uh, the Earth will still be around. We, our, we expect our Earth to last for about another four or five billion years. So that's about 500 million light years away, the Cartwheel Galaxy, getting way closer to us. It's perhaps the most beautiful picture uh, ever that's been released so far. I love this one called the Carina Nebula. So nebula just means cloud. Anything cloudy in space can be called a nebula. And in this case, it's a beautiful place where stars are being born. A real picture of this nebula. Now, the name comes from the fact that it's in the Carina constellation. The Carina is a keel of a boat. It's a constellation we can't see from New Jersey. And in this great cloud of gas and dust, stars are forming out of the gas and dust and condensing down and lighting up. So real picture, but I'll impose an animation on top of it showing star formation. So you don't have to collide two galaxies together to get new stars. You can also see it happening in nebulae like this, where matter comes together, it's more matter gets pulled in, and more matter and more matter. And eventually, there's so much heat and pressure in these protostars that fusion starts. That means that hydrogen gets converted to helium. That releases energy, and the star turns into a star. And it's a little edible, but in a few million years, the wind from these baby stars born from this nebula will blow away their parent nebula, and there'll be no more Carina nebula in about three uh, million, three million years. Little tear. So one last thing to point out. So we're looking at things really far away. But also, the James Webb is looking at stuff very close to home as well. So here is the sky again tonight, where it's the sky we started with. There is that moon again. And the brightest dot of light you can see tonight, looking up, if it were to clear up, you could see this anyway, is the planet Jupiter. So the Carina Nebula we just saw is about 8,000 light years away. The planet Jupiter is about 45 light minutes away. That's how long it takes light to reach us. Jupiter is the brightest dot you can see outside of Venus, which sets really early tonight, because it's really big and it's covered in shiny clouds. And the Webb 
also turned its attention to these neighbors of ours in the solar system. So here's a James Webb view of the planet Jupiter. So you can actually see the roiling great red spot. This is a hurricane about twice the size of all of planet Earth. And the lighter colored areas are areas where you have a lot of uh, intensity and some heat being generated. So the James Webb for us in this business is a gift that's going to keep on giving. There will be many more discoveries, many more amazing images, and it will allow us to, uh, we'll be updating our regular show called The Wonders of the Web, our regular matinee show, and add that new information in as we go forward. So again, it's just, I mean, thanks in large part to the web, but also thanks to going off and discovering that we can, in fact, alter the path of an asteroid by running an, uh, a little space probe into it. And especially with the discoveries of this creature here, the James Webb, it was a really extraordinary year, 2022, in astronomy, with discoveries made both in terms of getting humans back to, uh, to the moon and also exploring the deep universe. So we do hope as we go forward that as more discoveries get made, we're going to both have astronomers coming in and talking about those discoveries. Many local astronomers are involved, for example, in doing research on the web. And we'll also be updating our planetarium shows on a regular basis to include a lot of the great information that we see uh, coming out from space and astronomy. So with that, we're going to bring it to the end of our program. I wanted to mention that I'm going to walk out this way and be in the Science and Sphere, that big globe room. So if you want, have any more questions, you're welcome to follow me over there, and I can answer your questions there. If anyone does have tickets for the next show, the uh, laser show, you can stay in your seats. We can collect them in between the two shows. And I'd like to thank you very much for joining us for our updates on the wonderful year that was 2022 in astronomy.